Hello everyone. Welcome to uh, another long form video. Today, I'm gonna be hitting chest, triceps, middle delts. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to kind of just go on a little ramble here, specifically in relationship to content creation. Now, I'm sure a majority of you are probably not content creators, but if you are content creators, maybe this will be interesting. Or maybe if you're not a content creator, it'll still be interesting, but it's just something I've been thinking about and something that I kind of wanted to articulate uh, as something that may be valuable to some of you, especially again, those of you who are content creators. So for those of you who have been following me, uh, you've probably been doing so via Instagram for a number of years. Now I started making content like three and a half, four years ago. Uh, and you know, since three and a half, four years ago, I've basically posted at least one bit of content, if not more, depending on what you call content. You know, if you're calling it a post, it's at least one to two to three. If you're calling it stories, it's maybe five, 10 plus, right? All things considered. Um, and I've learned a lot through the experience of social media. And I think a lot of people give social media a bad rap and rightfully so in some regards, like I've mentioned, um, you know, my feelings about short form content and how it's helpful, but also limiting. It's this trade off. that's a little bit conflicting to me, but in the context of social media as a whole, which is a difficult thing to sort of generalize, I think that the way that the individual expresses their feelings about social media is really a reflection of what they put into social media. So here's what I mean. Really in the first, mm, I wanna say two and a half years of my, my content creation um, uh, uh, timeline, I made this transition from just making content because I wanted to do it and I wanted to start to help people. And I was really, really enjoying it during that time period. And this was back when I had a couple thousand followers on Instagram. I wasn't, my account wasn't really gaining traction. And it was just kind of like very, very little at a time. A couple people followed me a day. And over time, you know, that grew um, exponentially, exponentially as many things uh, uh, tend to, uh, you know, with this game of attrition. And when my account started to grow, what I noticed is that I started to make more and more content for the sake of growth rather than for the sake of value. Uh, and I think a lot of people fall into this trap. I certainly fell into this trap. Not, not completely because my, my um, priority was always, I think, at least slightly in favor of, of value, even though there were times where I sort of slipped and I, and I said something stupid about someone or you know I uh, uh, sort of got angry about something and, and made a, an emotional, you know, post about it. And, uh, and, and it ended up, you know, eroding relationships with people. Like I, I've been through the whole works that most content creators go through when they're trying to gain traction. And I've learned a lot from that. And I've come out the other end to sort of realize that like the growth mindset in terms of focusing on follower count and focusing on, on growing follower count is extremely detrimental in a number of ways. So, and taken to its limit. So I'll, I'll articulate what I mean by that. So if you have this growth mindset and you have a thousand followers or whatever, and you get to 10,000 or maybe even 20,000 and you see that progress, you'll be, you'll be happy. And you may still sort of just be one of those people that like, you're always going to prioritize the value. It's not that important to you. Uh, and, uh, and the growth is not that important to you. And you, and you kind of stick to your, you know, uh, humility and, you know, a lot of people are not like that. I, I certainly was not like that. Uh, but a majority of people, what they're going to, I think, naturally respond to uh, is sort of the excitement around more people seeing stuff and more people seeing your stuff. And if you go through a period of a lot of growth, just you know, based on the actual quantity of people that are following you, um, what you'll experience is this like sense of elation about, oh my God, more people are listening to me. And so what you start to do is you start to slowly shift the priority more and more in that direction. And, and what tends to happen is then it's almost becomes this relationship where instead of putting these pieces of content that you find to be valuable out into the world and, and seeing the response from that, what you do is you start to try to predict the response from your audience or from the you know slew of random people who might see your video or your post. Uh, and as a consequence of that, you now start to put the value of the content to a secondary or tertiary level of consideration, meaning that the merit of the idea is, is really based off of this, this concept of growing in numbers rather than growing uh, a brand, growing the quality, continuing to provide value, continuing to provide solutions for people that need solutions. And what sort of starts to happen 
uh, over time, and this is how most things happen, is just sort of slowly and then all at once, right? It's just it's this game of, of attrition, is you slowly start to move in the direction, and sometimes not so slowly, you start to move in the direction of becoming this like false representation of what you maybe once were or maybe what you once were intending to put out. Um, and I find that that was sort of starting to happen to me where I, I started to become so aware of the metrics, so aware of the numbers when I never really had been to begin with. And I, what I started to notice was that my, my personality online started to move more and more out of alignment with who I actually am as a person. And the recognition that that was happening was enough for me to, to <laughs> pivot pretty much as far away from that as, as possible because I started to notice that it, would, that it would begin to, it didn't necessarily start to erode my relationships personally, but it did start to shift the way that I was thinking about the world in a very real sense. And I think that is the, the key sort of point here and the key takeaway to why this is actually so, so dangerous is because you can't represent yourself falsely in one medium and then be yourself truly in another. And who you are and being yourself is like, it's a very esoteric type of thing. Um, but I think to assume that you can sort of lie, lie in all these ways in one area and then not start to lie in all these ways in another area, I think that's a silly expectation. And when you start to craft content around topics that are polarizing for the sake of polarization, which again, I briefly sort of went through that immature timeline, uh, and, I, and, and I have come out of it having learned a lot about myself and having learned a lot about uh, uh, um, how much in our control the way we look at the world actually is. Um, and I feel like I've sort of come out the other end just really, really set on everything coming back to the value, right? So every single post, every single, and, and this is not to say that I don't still struggle with, you know, things that don't do well that I expect to do well. Sometimes I'll make a video and I'll spend hours, you know, editing something, filming something, and then it'll just flop and no one will see it. That's never, that's never a good feeling. Uh, but ultimately I can always come away from that knowing that like I put my all into what I thought was valuable and sure, maybe, you know, um, uh, not a lot of people see it uh, or, or maybe not a lot of people find value from it, right? But I know that I gave my best attempt and I know that that was true to uh, what was sort of uh, being called upon in me, right? Or, or was being brought out of me, right? It wasn't this thing that I selected out of, out of thin air that was sort of this fabricated facade, right? To, to gain traction, to gain eyeballs. Uh, and, and you can rest assured in those instances that like you 100% you have sort of um, aligned yourself with, with the character that you want to embody and, um, and with the kind of person that you want to be. And so I think that we often don't take the social media stuff seriously in one sense. And then in another sense, it's like, there's clearly a lot more to this than meets the eye. And, and if you're a content creator, my one word of, um, if you can call it wisdom, maybe it's wisdom, is always stay true to what your original goal is and make sure that you're checking in on that goal uh, every single time that you post. It seems extreme, it seems over the top, it's, it seems somewhat overstated, um, but as someone who has made thousands of individual pieces of content, I can tell you that all of the things that come back to you in terms of a response are uh, an indication, we'll say, not necessarily a direct correlate, but an indication of the way that you yourself are communicating, right? And so if all you see is negativity on social media, and that's your framework of this is what social media is and this is what it's for, instead of trying to uh, complain about or instead of complaining about the medium instead of complaining about oh the algorithm did this or th all these idiots came out of my post look at what you're doing and ask yourself what am i doing that's stupid uh where am i ignorant and how can i address that um, because what i noticed was when i started to really just focus on the value and not the number the number sort of took care of itself um, and I won't say that that will always be the case 100% of the time. There are obviously a lot of confounding variables that are involved in this equation of growth and, and all that stuff, uh, most of which I'm probably ignorant of. But I can say for sure that if you maintain your composure and you maintain your sense of self and you are telling the truth to yourself and to your audience about who you are and what your goals are and what you want to provide and what you are providing, um, then I can guarantee that at the end of the day, even if you don't get the result that you think that you wanted, 
uh, you'll come out of that having learned something rather than coming out of it being more rigid, more resentful uh, with, with, a, with a worldview that is inherently more negative and clearly not helpful. So I don't know if that made sense. Uh, hopefully it did. Hopefully it maybe helped someone. If it helped one person, if one person hears this and is like, oh, that's, that's interesting uh, and I, I learned something, I'm happy. Uh, and in any case, yeah, we're going to hit uh, triceps and chest and middle delt. So it'll be a fun day, some long form stuff. And uh, hope you all enjoy the uh, fitness content or the fitness section of today. So I figured I would go through the process of setting up a Smith machine incline press because it seems that a lot of people struggle with this kind of setup, okay? So the first thing you need to do is you need to figure out the angle that you're pressing at because um, some people just will arbitrarily put the bench at 45, some people arbitrarily put it at 30 or 15 or whatever. Start with the goal and then work backwards from there. So my goal today is to kind of do some kind of like mid incline press, right? So if we're calling this decline, if we're calling this flat, right? Again, arbitrarily flat, okay? Because relative joint positions are the king here. And we'll say this is the most inclined. I'm gonna do something that's like in between that. You know, so for me, if you, if you took this camera right now and you tilted it sort of backwards, It'll be an angle that's like just above horizontal. So that's where I kind of want to land with this thing. So I'm going to take a best guess and I'm going to say, let's just put it there. One tick up. It's probably like 10 degrees, 15 degrees or something like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine where are my shoulders? Okay. Probably like right here. And I'm going to lay down and I'm going to be like, okay, how does this bar interact with me? Uh, it feels like it's slightly too high. So what I'm going to do, and by high, I mean, it's just closer to my neck. So I'm going to scoot back a little bit. And voila. So that was fairly lucky because I haven't set this kind of thing up in a little while. Um, but the point is just take a best guess, reassess, uh, and along the way, make sure that you're staying in line with what you envision the goal to be. So again, I set my arm path first, and then because I've done this a, a good amount of times, I just took a best guess of like, okay, that's kind of where my hand was gonna end up with the bar. Easy peasy. Now, this may take a lot more little shimmies and, and stuff like that. So I would say um, some general guidelines and some rules that you can follow is when you get this bench in here and you're going through the testing stuff, um, you wanna kind of start from the bottom up, okay? So what I mean is I started with the empty bar right up there, but best case scenario, you start with the bar down here, right? And the beauty of the Smith machine is that you can actually move the bar all the way down to set your grip. And so what I would do is I would, you know, pull to a position that's comfortable. You know, for me, it's probably arms in line with the body. And then basically just get to a point where forearm is around 90 degrees from the bar, okay? If your arms are this way, it's gonna be basically you're doing a weird tricep press. And if your arms are outside of that, that's gonna also not feel comfortable for a number of different reasons, um, you know, most of which are crummy elbow and forearm related. Okay, so find the 90 degree position, put your hands there as your grip, unrack from that point, and then we're good to go from there. Now, the specific kind of press I'm gonna be doing today is very much a pec dominant press, okay? So what that means is that I'm gonna stay, you know, mostly in that sort of bottom, um, we'll call it 60%, right? I'm not gonna go and do this part of the motion, right? Because from here up is mostly like a triceps thing, okay? So if you wanted to do a full press, chest and triceps, do the full range. But if you wanna just annihilate your freaking pecs and your delts, just kind of groove in this bottom end of the range. You're gonna maintain a lot of load from this thing. And also what you're gonna realize um, is you're gonna keep tension on your pecs and you're not gonna have so much tricep involvement because we're doing triceps separately. Uh, I'm very much a divide and conquer kind of person rather than just say, hey, let's blend it all into one thing. So that's generally how I set this up. An additional point that I would say is aside from starting in the bottom, um, 
a really, really big key here is, is to make sure that you're setting up in your active range of motion. So what that means is not only that you're setting the joints in the positions that you want for the muscles that you're trying to train. So for me, this goal is really middle and upper pec specific. So I'm gonna kind of squeeze in between those points and then see where my arms land. And then I'm just gonna kind of reverse action, right? You wouldn't pull up here and then randomly go there, right? You would, in the same way that if you were sort of aligning a press this way, you would, you would naturally pull your arms back this way. You wouldn't just randomly pull them up here and back here. So start from the squeeze, reverse action, get under and be like, oh, where does that reverse action end be, right? And from this point, again, because I'm really thinking middle upper pec, I'm not gonna worry too much about getting my arm super far behind my body. If you think about upper pec mainly and front delt mainly, they don't translate the shoulder girdle, meaning they don't protract and retract the shoulder girdle. If that was, if you've never heard those terms before, it basically just means uh, the upper pec and the front delt, they don't move the clavicle and they don't move the scapula. They just move the upper arm to the clavicle. But the middle pec plays a big role in retraction, protraction, as well as moving the arm. So if your goals are more upper pec related, the sort of shorthand of that is you don't have to worry too much about getting all the way back into retraction because your upper pec is not a, a protractor. Uh, and although it will stretch a little bit uh, more with your arm slightly farther behind your body, the difference is probably negligible in terms of the mechanical advantage stuff. So again, once you set up in this position and you kind of got all those things down, forearm angle, active range, um, bench angle relative to that. Oh, and then last thing is just to make sure, ooh, is just to make sure that your elbow stays pretty much under the bar, right? You don't want your elbow super in front of the bar. You don't want your elbow behind the bar. And when I say under the bar, I don't really mean the bar. I really mean the resistance direction. So if you look at this Smith machine from the side, it's actually slightly angled. So if the angle is kind of going like this, we'll say this is the angle, you want your elbow to be under that angle. So with this machine, and I'll, do, I'll film a set from the side, but your elbow should actually be moving sort of slightly forward and backward, um, not just straight up and down. If the Smith is angled straight up and down, then your elbow should basically be moving perpendicular to the floor, straight up and down as well. So we'll just get some warm ups in here and uh, see how it goes. So how to properly warm up. Step one, make sure your setup is appropriate for your structure. Step two, put some load on the bar. I just put 25s on either side, fairly uh, light for me. And then uh, what you're gonna do from there is you're just gonna do some reps. And the cool part about this is that when you do some reps with the lightweight, you can just take the lightweight off and then you can add slightly more weight and then you can do that weight. And uh, that's pretty much the warm up, right? The purpose of a warm up is not to mentally masturbate your way around doing 10 different exercises that have nothing to do with the actual exercise you're doing, right? It's just to perform the motion, perfect the skill, make sure you're actually concentrating on the skill and uh, slowly add load until you're working weight. That's how I go about it. Now, the question of should you touch your chest, I think is really missing the point. Uh, that should be sort of a secondary tertiary thing that you think about after what you've done is set this up properly and measured the active range stuff, right? Because you don't really have to ask that question if uh, you have it answered otherwise. Meaning you don't have to ask, should I touch my chest? If you know what range you're already using. And if you aren't thinking about the range that you're using, well, then that's the problem. That's a, that's, that's a problem to begin with. So identify the range based on the goal. If you don't have a goal, you need to set up a goal and then you move forward from there. So this is my third warm up. 
And it'll probably be my last warm up. Oh, another thing too. Make sure you got your safeties on. Another beautiful part of the Smith is to make sure that you're practicing safe sets. So that'll probably be, we'll see how this is. Let's see if my hands are gonna hit it. Okay, so that's, that's not too high. So the unfortunate thing here is my, my perfect settings are where the safeties are kind of in between being too high and too low. So what I'll probably do is actually stick something between the safety and where it normally is. So I'm about to do the first working set here, but I went over to the other side of the gym and got one of these things. I don't know if you can see that. It's one of those weight supporter things. I'm going to put that right there. Is that the smartest or the safest? Oops, probably not. But if I want to fail properly, I think it's worth it. So we probably only need that on one side. So wish me luck. So, I don't really think I need this. It's also kind of making me a little nervous. Because I can just rack it here. Fail yeah, like a normal human. So set number two here. I figured I'd show this angle. Um, so it'll be set two of three. Three sets of failure, move on. Next exercise, um, which will be a little bit more middle, lower pec dominant. Um, figured I'd show this angle too, so you can kind of see motion of the arms. And how, in terms of cueing, all you really need to think about when you're using this sort of partial range thing, if your forearms are in the right spot, you're really just thinking about this sort of small vertical window, right? Because this bone is going to be sort of arcing upward, and then it's going to be arcing inward. You don't really need to think about the inward portion, right? This bone here specifically goes up, 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 and then it goes in, 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 in. You don't need to think about the inward portion because not locking. So just think about sort of moving in the vertical portion of this arc for this particular variation. Also think for those of you who are struggling with setup that starting this exercise in this low position from where you'll most likely have the most trouble stabilizing control like it is actually a good idea good hack So a sort of middle lower pec thing going on here. Cable press, cable converging. Um, I'm gonna show you all how I set this up, much like I showed with the Smith machine. First thing I do 
is I take a guess. Because all of this is ultimately going to have to be a guess to begin with. So if, it's, if I can, if it's convenient, I'll angle the bench upright. Because I have these long handles, I don't really have to squirm to try to get back here. So I can afford to use like an upright position. The problem, however, arises when you have a cable sack like this and you only have the short handles. So if you only have the short handles, you either need to move this bench closer and then angle it flat and then put the cables all the way low, um, or you need to get an extender for those handles. Um, there are a couple problems with this, which I may run into in terms of the bench shimmying back and forth. So that's another thing is if you don't want to put a weight behind this, you can also just move it flat and move the cables down. So maybe I'll just to show it, maybe I'll do one set with this upright and then one set where I move it lower and I use the same sort of relative angle. Now, when I say relative angle, I am talking about the angle that my arm is being loaded relative to the cable, right? Because if I want to load this direction, sort of slightly, lie, slightly high to slightly low, then I want the cable to sort of move in line with me, right? I can do that in an upright position with cables here, or I can put the bench flat and move the cables down and sort of shimmy myself so that that same exact loading angle is actually mimicked, okay? So if none of that made sense, just remember, it's about the loading angle relative to your body, not just what the bench angle is. So kind of how I like to gauge this in terms of a guess. So I'll just say, okay, where did the handles get to? Looks vaguely right. And I'm noticing that I'm a little shifted here. So kind of center the bench. And then let's just see now. The proper way to get into any cable press, because this will be heavier, this is just a warm up, is grab with two arms, grab one cable, and then basically wrap it around yourself, right? When you wrap it around yourself, it'll just be sort of pushing your body into the bench, okay? And then reach back and grab the other cable with the single arm, so single arm, single arm, single arm is wrapped, other arm is grabbing the cable, and then use the weight of this cable that you're already holding to pull you into position, okay? It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. So this ended up being a pretty uh, good guess, but this angle feels still just a little bit wide for me. So another helpful tip maybe when you're sitting here, right, if you can kind of visualize where the cable origins are, pull yourself back into that position, which is, again, slightly high to slightly low. Again, have your aim, set your arm path relative to your aim, and then set the cable up relative to that, just like we did with the Smith machine. Don't just haphazardly get in there like I did, um, and then try to do it. So I noticed I was a little bit, it felt like a little bit too wide for me. It felt like I was being pulled out too much and not enough backward. So I'm just gonna shift the bench maybe an inch forward, right? and then reassess, do the same thing. So I'm gonna do my first set now, just take a guess about the load. Um, and with these, um, I'm gonna look to sort of briefly pause on the first couple reps, and then just hammer out the rest of the range, whatever I have left, sort of in that length of position. Cause you'll be able to get to a full lock for a couple reps. But if you keep trying to go there, when that short position is fatigued, you're gonna lose a lot of output in the stress position. So see how it goes. And again, grab one side of the cable, turn and rotate, grab the other, and then use that other side to pull you back to center. So I'm just gonna do the partials now. And when you're racking the cables, by the way, you just reverse action it, right? So I started with the right and then I looped over and grabbed the left. So. I let go of the left first, 
and then I let go of the right to get out. Um, and as you saw, that range of motion just kind of naturally decreased as I went on. It wasn't like I really super intentionally um, was like, oh, I'm gonna use short and range now. I just sensed, okay, I can't really get to that position without some kind of compensation. So I'm just gonna sort of let the range drop and then end up capping out the end of the stretch position there. And when I stop the set is basically when I can't move out of that bottom position. I'm not saying everyone should do that, but uh, if you're fairly comfortable with your training technique and uh, your ability to fatigue without losing that, then uh, you know, take it to the house. So I'm just gonna do one more of these and then move on to uh, triceps. And grab one with two arms, loop around, set the other. So moving on to triceps now, something I find interesting about this whole triceps training conversation is that a lot of people will complain about their elbow pain. And then what happens is they're like, okay, let me do some cable exercises just to warm up the joints. Like I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna do this, right? So my elbow feels nice and good and loose. And then I'm gonna go over into a barbell skull crusher where I can go fuck my elbows up uh, repeatedly, right? And I'm kind of sitting there wondering like, why wouldn't you just, the thing that is making your elbow feel good and also accomplishing the goal, uh, what's, why would we not just continue to do that? It's a great, uh, it's a great question to, to maybe ask. So I'm gonna do the warm up here with some light weight, and then I'm just gonna add more weight and, uh, and do the same thing. And I think that overall, um, that should be a good you know, pr first principle to subscribe to, is <laughs> if, uh, if you need a warm up for a muscle group that is not the exercise you're doing, you should go find a different exercise to do. Um, and what I'm gonna do with these today is I'm gonna do like a fun little drop set, like mechanical drop set, where I'm gonna do straight arm until I fail. And then I'm gonna change the load direction a little bit with my uh, change in arm path and uh, take it to another level of fatigue, just as kind of a fun thing to do. So you'll see what I mean here in a second. I'm gonna kind of just go to failure, getting a good squeeze at the bottom. And when I can't get to the bottom, then we'll do the drop. So reps starting to slow. And that's probably the last one I'll do here. So grab with the other hand, step in front, and then just set the cable so that it's Staying over your shoulder joint and then let the elbow move horizontally. So you're really loading the shit out of the stretch position here. So the goal there, you fatigue the short, right? By just doing something with a load that can load this position and then, um, move the cable behind you so that you can load that fully elbow bent position. But when I'm in that elbow bent position on the second variant, don't just let yourself get smushed, right? You should actively be shoving against the handle throughout the entire range of motion. So if you're, and this is a good rule of thumb for, you know, good principle for every exercise is make sure you're always 100% of the time shoving in a direction that is opposite the resistance. So if the resistance is upward this way, I'm always shoving downward on the way down. 
and I'm still shoving downward on the way up, but I'm allowing my arm to be lifted. If you lose contact with the ability to shove in the direction opposite the resistance, then you're no longer controlling the weight. So that is a good first principle to subscribe to. Always be shoving in the direction opposite the resistance. Because if you're not shoving in the direction opposite the resistance, you are not controlling the resistance, right? How could it be any other way? So can't get there. Step here, butt is shoved up against the pole. Foot is shoving me backward. And I'm just shoving down. Another thing that I'll note here too is just the contact points, right? So if the load is pulling me in this direction, I want to be able to sort of shove into something at least in front of me, but more preferably sort of above me. Problem with doing it single arm and shoving above is like my other tricep is really fatigued from the prior set. So shove with the elbow and just kind of lean a little bit, right? And that's your stability. That's your anchor off of which you perform this. So again, if you get back to a position where you feel like you can't still shove away from the cable, then you've lost control. So don't get to that point. So last exercise, single arm cable Y raise. I like to set this up sort of at or below hip height, depending on sort of where I'm aiming to raise, right? So again, as with all other variants, you wanna set the height of the cable before you actually sort of figure out what you're doing or just take a guess, experiment with a light load. With all cable lateral variations, I like to load with a D handle on the backside of the wrist, right? So I'm not actually grabbing the handle to make grip a limiter to have to manage all this forearm stuff. I'm actually looping my hand through and then letting the loop sit on top of the wrist. This is for a lot of different reasons, but the main benefit in short is just that you don't have to worry about any kind of forearm fatigue or elbow fatigue, which oftentimes can end up limiting output. So, and comfort. So I'm just going right into this. I've got my anchor here on my opposite arm. Make sure I'm shoving against it, especially as I initiate the motion. And I'm not worried about getting to the top half of the range where there's going to be a lot of trap stuff. Just focus on the middle delt. So again, when I set this loading direction, this whole motion is potentially a really long, wide arc. Right, so it can arc from here all the way until my arm is in line with my body. But you don't really, really want to be sort of using that back end of the range if your goal is middle delt. And if your goal is middle delt, you also want to be loading sort of where your arm is in front of the body. So notice how the cable is pretty close to 90 degrees to my arm at the bottom. And then as I raise up, the cable will get closer to my body, right? The cable getting closer to my body makes the load drop off in terms of the rotation on this upper arm. But it also, at that point, just really wants to translate my whole shoulder girdle inward. So you get a lot of trap sort of in this top 20%, which is fine uh, if that's your goal. But if you want this to be mostly a middle delt fatiguing exercise, just use like that first 70, 80% of the range where you're just kind of moving in a straight line 
inward to outward, where you have a significant amount of loading on the, uh, on the delt. So for this last set, what I'm going to do is a little bit of a fun drop set. Don't necessarily try this at home. You'll see what I mean. So just go to failure like we were doing before. So you can't move out of the bottom. And once you do that, move the cable loop up right below the elbow and just kind of go through the same range. Go to failure. Oh God, I'm gonna move it up just for the last one a little more. I like to turn a little away. So as you bring the cable closer to the joint, I think moment arm decreases, right? So torque on the shoulder decreases. So you can, you know, keep lifting, fun mechanical drop. <laughs> 